person you are. You could be an old man, you passed your prime, and because you have some kind of title or power or influence, young women will go after you. They'll be vulnerable or they'll be father wounds. And they look at you as a as a father figure and you take advantage of them sexually or monetarily or whatever. Um and uh and so it's it's not even about your physical looks or your sex appeal. There's something where people gravitate to the anointing. There may even be something sexy about the anointing to some of these pe people. I, I don't know. Don't ask me. I, some of you are, are anointed, but I don't consider you sexy. Thank God. But uh, it's not about your looks. And if you have low self-esteem or if you don't think you're good looking and you have women uh, flattering you, coming on to you, you are going to be more susceptible and vulnerable because it strokes your ego to get involved or use your prophetic gift or your teaching gift or your title to uh, get in relationships with people. And you could say, well, I'm their spiritual father. That's another trap. They, they have a, a father wound. I, there's nothing wrong with being a spiritual father to women or to men, but don't Recording in progress. Don't use that as an excuse to um, don't use that as an excuse to do something that God is not pleased with. All right. Now, is this on a live stream? Oh, it's being live streamed. OK, good. So. Okay. No, wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Victor. That's why I need other people. Uh, and so I'm going to start off with Kyle Searcy weighing in on this for about 10 minutes and then Robert Gay weighing in on it. Uh, Kyle, are you there? No, there, I'm, not. I'm gone. Is, is there a propensity for people to manipulate others through the gift of prophecy and what I'm calling prophetic grooming, where they give a word specifically to start a relationship with the intent, whether conscious or subconsciously, of entering into some kind of uh, connection that's not of God? Is that something that happens? Well, uh, the answer to that would be yes in cases, but I think it's a bigger picture than that. Um, I love the way you started talking about the fruit of some of the things that have happened in Christianity primarily in the Western world and the kind of fruit that that has produced in the lives and the hearts of many people. What I hear us talking about in a lot of ways are heart issues. In Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. So the things that manifest in our life come from our heart, our heart posture. And if a person's heart posture gets off, they're going to use whatever they have toward their manipulative ends. It could be a Mercedes. It could be a gift. It could be prophecy. It could be preaching. If your heart gets uh, gets out of whack, you know, Jesus said in Matthew 13 um, that out of the heart come evil thoughts and adulteries and murders and fornications and thefts and false witnesses and blasphemies. So I, I think the condition of a person's heart is incredibly important. Uh, the New Testament doesn't actually give accuracy as the the benchmark as to whether a prophet is mature or not. It gives fruit and character. Jesus made it really clear, by their fruit you shall know them, Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them, not by their word, by their, by their accuracy, by their fruit. And then he expands it, do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, a bad tree bears bad fruit. So what does the fruit of their life manifest? What's the character of their life? Uh, even what do their prophetic, does their prophetic gift manifest? Um, all of those are things that really tell where a person's coming from. Jesus said, every tree that does not bear good fruit shall be cast down and thrown into fire. By their fruit, you'll know them. Uh, Matthew 7, a little bit after that, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, he who does the will of my Father. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? He didn't say it was inaccurate. We prophesied in your name. We cast out devils in your name. We did many wonders in your name. Again, the wonders were really wonderful. The devils maybe really went out. The words were maybe really accurate. But the problem was, 
I never knew you, gnosko in Greek, intimacy. That was, you, you weren't mine. It was a wrong spirit, a wrong influence. Uh, having traveled widely, I've seen many people from a demonic source give accurate uh, prophetic words and perform some signs. And we see an exodus where Moses threw down his stick and for a certain period of time, those from a demonic origin were able to dupl duplicate the same thing. So it's never been a sense of accuracy. It's always been a sense of character and fruit. So if your heart gets out of whack and you have a prophetic gift, a prophetic insight, then that will be used for manipulation, for uh, whatever it is that your heart is drawing towards. So the key is uh, some of the things you shared at the beginning, getting back to um, the Word of God and getting back to ways to to deal with this and uh, and deal with the hearts of people to make sure that people are true, sound disciples. Um, so the one aspect of this is, is where there could be false prophecy, false people, people who are not of the right stock, of the right root that are releasing their prophetic gift. Another aspect can just be immature prophetic. Uh, I don't think we would have been given the ability in the Word of God in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 14, 9, to judge if all prophecy was going to uh, actually be accurate. Let, uh, let two or three prophets speak and let the others stand by and judge. That word judge, diancrino, it means to stand aside from it and, and don't get involved in it, stand aside and look at it in an objective way and see which one of the three that spoke is better than the other ones. That's literally what that word means. So again, that gives room for immaturity in the prophetic. So I think where we have to be careful is there's false prophetic that comes out of a wrong motive that's used wrong, that comes out of the core of a false heart. But then there's also immature prophetic where there's judgment there to say, oh, no, you're, you're a good guy but you are often that. So you need to hone your gift, work on your gift. You need to be mentored and, and uh, that gift needs to be developed a bit more. So uh, I, th I just think some of the things that we could do uh, in terms of making sure our, our houses are solid is number one, not to despise prophecy. If you're not careful, a lot of the excesses out there can bring you to the place where you literally begin to despise the prophetic. You just shut it all down. Holy Spirit goes into a closet and uh, that is the wrong move. And, and again, it's not hard for that to happen, especially when you deal with immature people and you see people who are who have wrong motives. But the word of God warns, do not despise that. But then if we're going to receive prophetic ministry from someone, we have to know their fruit or know somebody who knows their fruit. By their fruit, you shall know them. So somebody just walking up to you unknown who releases a prophetic word uh, character reference. Who is this person? Uh, what We don't know their fruit. It takes time to understand and discern fruit. So we've, got, we've really got to uh, begin to think through how we can understand the core, the fruit of the person releasing prophetic word, even and especially in our houses. And then number three, we have to have some method of judging whatever is released in our house. Even when we do know a person is true and they come from a good core, there has to be some measure of judging that and the people who give those words have to be very, uh, very willing to allow people to say, no, that was off. No, this was good. We think you need to work on this more. And if that doesn't happen, then they shouldn't be allowed to prophesy. And I think also we just have to teach 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, all of 1 Corinthians 14 was Paul setting order on tongues and on prophecy and how it should be done and the motive by which we should allow it. So the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It's a very, very important gift. But people who go astray will use whatever they have. Jesus talked about the Pharisees who uh, would use prayer. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayer. So theirs wasn't prophecy, it was prayer. They would do these long, deep, profound prayers to open up the heart to the ladies, but that's because their core and their heart was corrupted. So when we find a brother with a corrupt heart or corrupt core or somebody who used to be a brother has gone astray, the Bible gives us insight as to how to deal with that. You with your spiritual restore them. They've got to be confronted. But it shouldn't be a surprise that if their heart and core is corrupt, they use their gifts uh, in a manipulative and a corruptive way. So we got to get back to being true Christians, true believers, disciples of Christ, as you said in the beginning. And if we do that, a lot of this becomes solved because that's not the case then I think we have to have uh, benchmarks, uh, uh, guardrails in place to make sure we protect our flock and protect those around us from some of the excesses. And what are some of those guardrails? Uh, number one, not to despise prophecy. Number two, making sure you know the fruit and the character of the people who are released with prophetic words. 
Uh, it's very important. Again, fruit takes time. So a person who walks in the church and is introduced as a master prophet should not be given a microphone the next Sunday or that Sunday. you got to know their fruit, their character, their life, their relationships. Uh, th those things that manifest the fruit in their life have to be made evident uh, before you're able to receive somebody as a genuine prophet of God. Again, not their accuracy, but their fruit. I'm not saying accuracy is not important. I'm just saying the word of God does not use that as the benchmark of discerning true prophetic. It's always character. It's their fruit. It's what their life produces. And then a method of judging. Set two or three elders or other prophets in the church to judge, and people have to know that there will be a judgment of whatever prophetic word they give. And then teaching of 1 Corinthians 14, the balance of that, we're not going to have more than one or two prophetic words released, and those are going to be judged. And here's the time in our service where we do that. I was at Mike Wells' church uh, not long ago, and um, I heard for the first time in a while uh, tongues and interpretation of tongues given as a spiritual gift. And there seemed to be a very, very orderly ability for that to happen. It was a time in service where that happened. There was the clear uh, explanation that uh, Pastor Mike got up and gave at the end of that. It was so beautifully done to eliminate confusion. So it was a perfect balance of not despising the gifts, but a, but enough order so that those gifts that are released don't bring confusion in the body. I think we have to have practices like that, and those could be some good guardrails. Robert may have a few more. Now, there's actually people called master prophets. <laughs> oh, you haven't met them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's like what I saw on uh, Twitter a few weeks ago. Uh, this guy is called the chief apostle of the earth with epistolic revelation. So that triggered that I wrote this article two weeks ago, 10 absurd practices in the apostolic. And point seven was this whole notion of being a chief apostle, running almost like a cult where everybody was called an apostle and his small following, and all they did was mimic his teachings and post his teachings on Facebook. And so this guy went after me on Twitter and said that I'm, uh, you know, started quoting scriptures to try to be mysterious and insightful out of context and saying I was a, 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 well, a, a river that was swelling up and quoting Jude and and it's like I just blocked all these people. But this is crazy. Master prophets. Okay, well, let's hear from a master prophet, Robert Gay. Well, Robert? Bishop, uh, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm so glad that you used my title this morning. I really do appreciate <laughs> it. And, uh, oh, my God. Yeah. It's amazing some of the crazy things that we hear uh, today, you know, that's going on in the name of the prophetic. And uh, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the things that is labeled prophetic today actually is more pathetic than anything else. And uh, it needs to change. Uh, and I love what everything that has been said, uh, 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 both by you and also by Kyle, has just been so powerful, so great. I say amen to every bit of it. Uh, I, I would just like to say as far as just if I'd follow up some on what uh, uh, Kyle was sharing about, and that is judging prophecies, um, you know, and this ties into also what you shared, Bishop, because the first metric that we have to use for judging prophecy is the written word. Uh, that is the metric that we use. The unfortunate thing is because of the ignorance that is in the church today, and I'll even say ignorance within the prophetic movement and people who call themselves prophets, you know, they got saved, uh, you know, uh, three months ago, they came into the body of Christ. They get a prophecy that they're going to uh, be a great man of God, a woman of God and prophesy. And they get activated and begin to move in that gift. And then they print their cards and, you know, and prophet will prophesy and they go to town. The problem is they're ignorant to the word. They have no uh, no Bible knowledge, no base foundation within their lives. And so as a result of that, not only do they prophesy incorrectly, but they also end up having no way to discern properly uh, the word of the Lord. And so it starts with some biblical knowledge, some biblical understanding. And it's something that's uh, needed today in an extreme way in the prophetic movement at large. 
Now, I'm very thankful that those who trained me in the prophetic and those I came up under had a good, a strong Bible knowledge and uh, had a strong foundation in those things. And that really helped a tremendous amount. But it's something that we uh, actually do need. Um, I would also just like to follow up on some things that Kyle said. He talked about how that uh, out of your heart and, uh, you know, again, from your heart flow the issues of life. Jesus said that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. There's two chapters that I write about in my book, The Voices of Deception. And one of them is called The the Voice of Polluted Wells. And the other one is called The Voice of Idols. And this is the reality. If somebody's heart is polluted, if you're, if the well of your spirit, man, is polluted, what begins to happen is there is a perversion of a prophetic gifting that ha- begins to take place within your life. And we've seen it happen so many times. And what I found is the greatest idol that somebody can actually have within their heart actually is the idol of self. And so uh, I've heard so many people out of that idol of self begin to prophesy things to manipulate people. For instance, um, somebody gets up and prophesies and says, anybody who speaks against me, the Lord would say that there's going to be judgment that comes upon them. Well, that's the idol of self-preservation. Self is at the center of that. Uh, or uh, somebody going to an individual and say, the Lord says that you're to be my spiritual son and you're to follow me. Well, that's an idol of self-promotion that begins to uh, uh, actually manifest in the way of prophetic ministry. So you have this mixture of an idol that's in the heart, and it's not only just in the hearts of those that may be receiving the word, but it's the idol that's within the heart of the prophet themselves. So whatever is in your heart, whatever is on the inside of you is what's going to begin to pour forth from you. And as that is really at the root of most all of these issues where people begin to groom people uh, with the prophetic word, they begin to groom them with things that they are declaring in the name of the Lord, which actually even delves over into uh, taking the name of the Lord in vain. And we've seen it happen before. Another thing that I would just share, uh, uh, I think you said something about even people prophesying things in parking lots. And that's one of the things we have in our church from day one. We have put that up as a parameter for all people who prophesy. I don't care how anointed you are. It doesn't matter uh, what dimension of anointing you flow in. We tell all of folks in our church, never prophesy to people in the parking lot. We always tell them it needs to be recorded and it needs to be able to be judged and needs to be able to be evaluated. And so we we record everything and make sure that nobody's just going outside the church and parking, uh, you know, prophesying to people that are in the parking lot. Now, obviously, there's no way that you can necessarily make that happen if somebody has an impure heart and they have a desire to do something that is ungodly or unholy, then that will begin to come out regardless of what you tell them. So again, the heart is at the issue of all of these things. Um, I'll say this. There was one time that I witnessed in the early days of my ministry, uh, there was a pastor that I was actually under, and he uh, he and his wife were wanting to go to this conference that uh, was taking place. They didn't have the money to actually pay for the trip. And they found out that there was a, uh, actually a new convert that had just come into the church and he had just received a large uh, family inheritance. And so what he did is he went to that individual and he said this, I want you to pray with me. I have a need. We need to, we need a financial miracle. We need it quickly because we want to go to this conference. And so he prayed with him right then. What you can guess in uh, what happened. The gentleman took out his checkbook, wrote out a check for everything that they needed and gave it to them. And so this is a form of uh, of manipulation, prophetic manipulation, using the word even or using your position your 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 place within that individual's life as a means to manipulate them for your own purpose. One of the things that is very important to realize about prophecy is this. Prophecy, particularly personal prophecy, is intended to bless, to benefit, to exhort, to comfort the recipient. It is not intended to bless 
the person who is actually giving the word. And so, uh, in other words, when I prophesy to somebody, it's not about me being benefited from that word. It's about them being benefited. Whenever we make ourselves the beneficiary of that which is coming out of our mouths, then what happens is we have we have twisted God's intent and twisted God's perf- purpose. We have perverted the very purpose of God for that which he has intended to come forth within the lives of individuals. And uh, actually, in one sense, we have betrayed our gift. We have... Um, we have used it in an improper way. One of the things I do appreciate about what Kyle talked about, particularly in uh, judging the fruit, look at somebody's fruit. One of the things that I've found is whenever the fruit is right, usually there is accuracy within the word. And typically whenever the fruit is bad, that's whenever there is an accuracy that is present. I know that the uh, accuracy is not necessarily determine how you determine true and false prophets, uh, uh, it is their character. It is the integrity that they operate with. But what I have found is this, whenever somebody has right character, when they have integrity of heart, typically, uh, nine times out of 10, uh, the prophetic word is going to be accurate. So, uh, one other thing I will say, and I'll, I will uh, hand it back. And that is this, a lot of these things that are happening or that we have seen happening in the prophetic movement involve sexual sin, uh, sexual misconduct. And I really believe that the greatest way to combat that is that ministers of the gospel, they be with their wives, if they're a man or if they're a woman, they be with their husbands as much as possible. Um, I I preach that. I teach that. Not only do I do that, but I exemplify it. Uh, If I travel somewhere, uh, usually my wife is going to be there. Uh, There was one person, um, and I I will not call their name, but they, uh, we had actually scheduled them for a meeting to come in and minister within our church. And then I found out that this gentleman was going to be coming with two females, neither one of them, his wife, he was going to be traveling with two females. Whenever I found out that he was going to be traveling with two females, I called him up and said, you know, we are not going to be able to have you come and minister. Uh, just the idea that, I mean, that, that to me is a setup for something really bad to happen. And uh, it just, these kind of things could be eliminated. A, a, tr- a lot of them just would not happen if ministers were close with their wives. And something that we have always stood against is, uh, is this uh, the ministerial spouse and ministerial mates. In other words, I'm married to one person, but yet this is the individual that I'm really, we, we kind of click ministerially and we minister together close. And I will say, again, that's just, that's a lie from hell, number one. And also it is a setup for sexual sin to take place. And these are the kind of things that bring such reproach on the body of Christ. And we lose our platform. Um, And then whenever we won't call it out and we want to address it within the church and we want to cover over it and just act like it didn't exist and try to hide it, uh, what we do and what we begin to speak to the world is that we are hypocrites and we say one thing and we preach against, you know, these sexual sins over here, but yet we, we don't clean out our own closet. And so uh, I know I've probably said a lot, but that's just a couple of thoughts that I had. No, that was great. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing to consider is spirit wives don't cost as much money to maintain. <laughs> that was a joke. That was a joke. All right. <laughs> Uh, so you you brought up something regarding and, and Kyle First Corinthians fourteen and and you alluded to that. I have an issue. That tell me if I'm wrong. Maybe I'm legalistic, and I agree with everything you just said and what Kyle said. Um, I have an issue when people have conferences and they promote personal prophecy to anyone who comes. I don't believe they should be prophesying over people unless their pastor or their elder is there. Because they, there's nobody capable of judging it. Even if you record it, how do you know they're going to bring it to them? Maybe they hear what they want to hear. Maybe they're going to get a word that doesn't jive with their lifestyle. I've seen so many people called apostles in conferences. And uh, some of these people I know aren't even walking with God. So what do you think? I mean, I have a problem with, if you want to attract a lot of people at a conference, 
advertise that everyone's going to get a prophetic word. But to me, your prophetic ministry should be limited by who the pastor brings or elders bring that will be there judging the word as they're getting prophetic presbytery or prophecy. Maybe I'm being legalistic, but what do you think, Robert? Well, maybe I shouldn't put you on the spot. Oh, wow. <laughs> I feel like I'm about uh, to step into it here. Um, I, I don't have a strong opinion one way or another on this. I think what you're promoting is the best case scenario. I believe that uh, that is the should be the best thing. Uh, one of the things that will prevent some of that from taking place is if there is prophetic ministry available in the local church. In other words, we make prophetic ministry available within our local church where there are leaders, seasoned leaders that are there that are ministering to people. And so that means that, and we tell our people, you don't have to go to another conference to receive prophetic ministry. Uh, so the problem that we have many times is, is people are in churches where there is no type of prophetic ministry, but yet they're crying out to hear from the Lord. And so they will go to a conference because they are seeking direction. They're seeking insight. They're really wanting to hear, you know, God, what's your will for my life? What's the purpose that you've established? Because that's one of the things that the prophetic does. It, it begins to articulate God's purpose for our lives. It also is, it's, it waters the seed that may already be there and causes it to blossom, begin to bring forth. Well, in churches where prophetic ministry is not allowed, they haven't embraced it. Maybe they've refused the truth because they have seen the abusing of the truth. So what, what happens is then laity, you know, just members of the church, they begin to reach out. And because they're not even taught on it, they look at it many times like a crystal ball, which is a whole nother uh, a road that we could go down because the, the prophetic is not meant to be a crystal ball to tell you your future. It's to release you into your future. It's to release you into destiny, not just to tell you what it is. God's word is there to bring fruit in your life. So I think the ideal is the best case scenario is that first of all, people are receiving prophetic ministry in their own local churches where there is an apostle, their prophets or pastors or whatever leaders have been established there that can oversee that prophetic ministry. And there's some measure of accountability then. Um, I think what's led as a, what's led to the issue that you're speaking of is the fact that, um, again, it's not available in churches. And so I think the best would be if it's not available in churches that uh, people take those words back to their pastor and I know exactly what you're saying. We had one time a, 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 a couple, they went, I'll just say this, they went to a prophetic meeting somewhere. And in these prophetic meetings, they received a word. And this word was the Lord was going to use them to correct the leadership within the church. Well, these folks had all kinds of issues within their own lives. Well, the next thing you know, they're coming back and saying, the Lord told us, spoke to us, we are called to correct the issues in the leadership, and we have come to correct you, and we've come to tell you uh, everything uh, that's wrong and what you're doing wrong. Well, obviously, they were the ones that received correction quite quick, quickly, because that's, first of all, as we all know, that's out of order. And uh, I think that some of the some of the things within the prophetic that uh, may need to be addressed, I'll just and I'll be interested well, to hear what Kyle has well, to say about my, that. Well, yeah, my take, my response to that would be, if it's a conference for pastors and leaders, mm -hmm. that's different, you know, sure. uh, because you should be mature enough to be able to judge the word. Yeah. Uh, you know, high-level marketplace leaders who are mature in the Lord. But generally speaking, how could we follow First Corinthians 14 if they don't have a bad pastor judging it or an elder? Sure. So... Me, I would say, if you're going to have prophetic ministry open to the public, you should have prophetic presbytery where people apply and sign up, and they should be either interviewed or we should try to discern 
who they are, if they're a new Christian, they're not a leader, if they come from a cessationist church, then yeah, let them come. But if they come from a, you know, Pentecostal charismatic church who practices the gifts, they should, you know, either have an elder come or get permission. There's got to be some way because we're not called to shepherd these people. How could we judge the word? We don't even know anything as a safeguard for these people. I think the best case is prophetic presbyteries where people sign up and the application is analyzed. And uh, I loved it, uh, you know, out of the latter rain movement. I don't agree with everything in the latter rain, but one of the things that came out of it was prophetic presbytery, where in a church they would have a presbytery, they would have people sign up to be in the presbytery, and the pastor and elders would pick who they want in it. And they would have a certain cap on the amount of people. And the people getting prophesied over would fast three days. And the people who were part of the presbytery would fast three days. And that was, I, I've done several of those. It is so powerful. So powerful. Anyway, Kyle, any comments? No, I align with what Robert said. Um, it, it's not biblically forbidden to do that and to, uh, and to have public prophetic as long as the leader of the conference and those that are being released in the prophetic have been vetted uh their character is known so i'm i'm aligning strictly with where robert was i think it's a best case scenario but i think it's number one very difficult to execute uh any other way than uh <clears throat> than the way he spoke of it so i'm uh, i'm aligning there okay cool now I know Kevin Matthews moves in the prophetic as well. Kevin, you want to weigh in on any of this? And soon we're going to have a post table Q and A. So, uh, any any word from you, Kevin Matthews? Uh, <clears throat> I, I think going back to what both of you said, uh, but just commenting on what what you were saying about judging prophecy. I think we have to go back and really reiterate that the way we judge prophecy is with the word. And if a line doesn't line up with the word, either in concept or in accuracy, then it has to be dismissed. That would deal with probably 70% of what is out there. And I think that uh, biblical standards are important. And then the other thing... Uh, um, that hasn't kind of been touched on, is we really have to teach what Paul said about prophecy, which is we prophesy in part. Uh, all prophecy is only ever partial. And so when we talk about accuracy, something can be accuracy, but it's only ever partial. And I've had these discussions with high-level prophets and had some ding-dong <laughs> conversations over it. Because whoever they are, the best they will ever do is prophesy in part. And so, yeah, what Kyle said is uh, uh, absolutely the standard that we must not know. Uh, we must not uh, diminish the standing of the prophetic word and the standing of prophetic within the body. But let's keep it in context. It's partial, and it's meant to be judged by the word. So. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, I'm not totally dissuaded. I'm not a fan of opening the prophetic to the public unless it's a leadership conference. So that's where I'm at. Unless it's prophetic presbytery with, with application and all that. I've just seen too much. Even I've seen mature prophets make mistakes without... I've seen... You know, if I mentioned this person's name, you'd know them. Call someone an apostle. This person wasn't even an epistle. So I just think there's too much confusion. And I think it should have they should have some kind of elder present or application vetting process. So that's where I'm at. I think I put that in my book, Prophetic Stand, um, on the prophetic pro pro process of prophetic ministry. But we all agree in general that we could, uh, we have to be accountable, that the prophet should not point to themselves, that the prophet uh, should never uh, allow the, their, their 
sinful nature to get the best of them, like we saw with Balaam, who utilized the prophetic for money and power with King Balak. And we have seen uh, people abuse every one of the ministry gifts, not just the prophetic. We've seen false teachers, televangelists, uh, pastors, and 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 abusive apostles. So we're not picking on the prophetic, but in these tables, we try to deal with stuff that people don't want to touch with a 10-foot pole that will help bring discernment. Ned Merriman, you have your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to tack on. I think uh, a couple of the major issues facing the prophetic is that largely the prophetic exists as a subculture within the church. I think even within the charismatic church, and it's that subculture creates an echo chamber that doesn't allow it to actually become as healthy as it should become. Um, it's 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 kind of like taking a seed and planting it somewhere uh, in an environment that only allows partial potential to to come forth. I think the other issue is, and especially as you know, Bishop, I've been doing this deep dive for the last handful of years is a lot of modern day charismatic and i would say especially prophetic churches are so radically disconnected from an understanding of church history and understand the language used and if if we could just have some some educational resources on that i think it would probably upset a lot of people but at least in generations moving forward they grab hold of it could help eliminate a lot of this this nonsense that goes on within it. I mean, honestly, I just for me, ninety percent of what goes on as prophetic ministry will be unrecognized in the first three centuries of the church, and that Absolutely. makes it novel. Absolutely, I think we've seen, and maybe we'll do a table on on this. We've seen a return of Montanism in the second century where. People glibly said, thus saith the Lord, Priscilla and Maximilla with uh, the Bishop Montanus. And they traveled, given prophecies, and they were looked at as oracles of God equal to Scripture. And then they wind up uh, prophesying over the second coming of Christ, when it was going to happen, and a lot of that kind of stuff. So this is the second century. Folks, this is 1,800 years ago. And we're seeing Montanism again. But uh, yeah, we have to have some biblical literacy and history does repeat itself. So if you don't know church history, you're probably falling into some of the mistakes the early fathers had to grapple with. Not that everything they said was accurate. The Bible is the bottom line, but we could learn from them. Wow, great, great stuff, Ned. Anybody else? Question, comment, or Kyle or Robert Gay, you want to say anything else? Anybody else? Uh, Joe, just real quickly, I, and I love what Ned uh, actually said, uh, particularly the, about the echo chamber. I think most prophetic people are, they, they end up gravitating to voices that will actually say what they want to hear. And uh, prophetic people in general do not want to be challenged. And uh, I think that uh, just the prophetic in general has to be willing to be challenged. And I think we saw that even whenever uh, you wrote the uh, uh, the uh, prophetic, prophetic standards. standards. Yeah. Uh, I mean, many did not want to be challenged. And the thing is, if we can't pass the test, if we can't pass the biblical test, the Bible's not going to change. And we need to change. And we need to adjust what we're doing. And... Uh, you know, the other thing that I would definitely say is that uh, I, I think it's just very important, very, very important that we understand because when people are being trained in the prophetic, one of the things that we heard common and I, uh, was that uh, when you're in training and you're just learning to hear the voice of the Lord, it was kind of presented in this way. When in doubt, do it. In other words, if you weren't sure, you go ahead and speak it, but just don't call it prophecy. And that might be fine, but you have to be able to, whenever whenever you begin to give somebody a prophetic word, that rule you do not go by. 
if you're if if you're not sure this is the Lord, you don't speak it. You don't you you have to be without a shadow of a doubt. I know that this is God. I know this is from heaven. I know this is the Lord. Uh, but if you're just well, I think I heard, and we've told our uh, people, our the people that we raise up that we train, said whenever you minister prophetically, uh, if you have to say I think I heard the Lord say, then don't te- don't say it to somebody. Uh, you need to know that you heard from the Lord before you speak things. You don't you don't speak things just because you think well it might have been God, and every voice that you hear is not the voice of the Lord. And some people think just because they got a prophecy about being a prophet, they begin to believe that everything they hear, regardless of what it is, it's God speaking to them. And we have to be able to discern what is, you know, what is soul and what is spirit. Uh, And if we are not able to do that, then what happens, we'll end up saying things presumptuously and we'll end up missing it. Okay, here's another one that'll get you and Kyle or the others in trouble. And I love this stuff. I don't care what people think of me, basically. So it is a very popular thing of activating the prophetic. And what about, is there a vetting system where someone should be a mature Christian before they're activated? and maybe even understand if there's a proclivity, because that's very popular all over the world, and especially in schools that are prophets. So what if a person is safe for two weeks, he goes to a one-week school of the prophets, and he gets activated? How, I'm asking the question now, how is that per, How does that person have enough biblical knowledge to know the difference between his soul and his spirit? He could just be speaking what comes to his mind, and he would have no clue. Now, could God do that? Of course he could. But am I getting into dangerous territory? Someone correct me. There's a difference between activation and maturation. You can activate something, and it's not yet mature. Uh, It's the beginning of it. Like Paul talked about stirring up the gifts that are in you. Uh, the gift of faith that dwelt in Timothy by the laying on of hands and by his association with his grandparents. So there could be budding gifts that are in our heart that can be activated in a way brought to the forefront, but that activation doesn't mean maturation. So yeah, you can activate gifts and people stir them up is a better word that I'll use, but that again, doesn't mean that the person is at a place of optimum maturity. That's where discipleship comes in. We again, teach, train, guide them. Uh, there's a there's a process to maturity and gifts, just like there's a process of fruit that grows in the sense of, you know, the, the corn, the ear, the full corn in the ear. So again, activation is not maturation. So here, let me ask this question based on what you're saying. What is the point of activating a prophetic gift with a, someone who's three weeks old in the Lord who doesn't have discernment? Is there a point in doing that? Is there a process that they should go through first before they're encouraged to prophesy? These are questions. Bishop, can I answer by another question, possibly? Yeah. I think we're getting, you know, I could be off here. You guys correct me. But I think we're conflagrating or whatever that word is. Conflating. Yes. Um, Some of the gifts and the difference. If I just read this in my quiet time. It's why it's fresh. But. The man that Jesus, the demoniac that he healed, he went and he told him to preach. There was no activation or there was no training, but he was activated. The woman at the well, he said, go in and tell everybody that the Messiah is here. There was no training whatsoever. And so is the prophetic gift to edify the body through any individual that 1 Corinthians 12 says the spirit gives as he wills, are there conditions for that other than it has to edify the body and it has to build up because it's no different than any other gift? I think if we're talking about an office and a ministry of that, such as what Ephesians 4 is or even Romans 12, I think we've got to discern the difference. I could be off, but I'm just saying. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not against if a new Christian says to me, hey, I had a dream last night. Tell me what you think or I just feel this strong thing in my heart. I I think it's God, but what do you think? I think God could speak to anybody. I'm talking about activating, which means that you're actually condoning and commissioning them in a sense 
to prophesy. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, Ned, do you have your hand up? Ned? Yes. Yeah, so, so this is really interesting to me. So I, I would say, um, I think that as I, as I study deeper and deeper into the, the fathers and just practically being around the prophetic, looking at the fruit of people who are very new being quote unquote activated. I think it's very dangerous to do that apart from a process of discipleship. If the sovereign spirit of God wants to manifest a gift of prophecy that's on the spirits that's the spirit's prerogative the danger that i saw i, I came across this a handful of years ago and it's really a fascinating documentary to watch uh and this is not weirdo conspiracy land land stuff this is a stanford professor who worked with the cia it's called third eye spy this is all documented but uh, was with the remote viewing program in the intelligence agencies. And again, this is documented, not Hello, out there. everyone. Type stuff. Welcome to another episode of Chino's Arsenal. Make sure you guys are liking. I don't know who that. Okay. Well, you got so angels anyways, following you. Okay. Yes. The documentary is called Third Eye Spy. It's available on Prime. It's very, it's, it's very easy to watch. But basically what they did towards the end is they activate people in, the, in, in remote viewing. What this Stanford scientist came across is this, is that, and actually I've heard Mark Sharona touch on this before, but that there's just a part of the human being that is, is very difficult to quantify that touches on things in what we might call the unseen would explain as supernatural when it's really just a part of the human. Now, I'm not saying that's the same thing as the gift of prophecy at all. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I think it's distinct. The issue is, is I think with some of these practices, we may be getting the things that are not actually prophecy, but seem prophetic. I'm saying this is a possibility. Now, the other aspect I'd say, and this is, this may be a little bit out there for some of y'all, and, and Bishop, you can rein in or speak to me on it if you want. But another thing that I've begun to learn, a, or I've been studying for a little while, is in the East, you have the essence of God and energies of God doctrine that generally they do not have in the West. And so without going into that, what it comes down to is one thing with especially the spiritual giftings, and we know this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in the Greek, it's not spiritual giftings, it's the spirituals. And so what we get to with the Eastern Christian doctrine, which all, with the people that, 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 that back this, many of them are church doctors, and wasn't much of a, a serious argument up into the 700s, 800s. I think you get into it mostly with um, the schism and then a, and the Barlamite um, and Gregory of Palmas uh, conflict. But to say this is that the giftings of the Spirit, their manifestation, are not the manifestation of a gift. Now, I'm talking under this doctrine, okay? It's not a manifestation of a gift that's deposited by the Spirit of God. It's the manifestation of the Holy Spirit himself within a cooperative person with him. And so it's a working in cooperation with that person. It's not even a step away from the person of the Spirit. So in that, I think it's it, it, if, if we use, one takes that seriously, I'm not inviting everyone to take that seriously. It's priced in something that many of you haven't been taught, but it's out there. Um I think we have to approach the gifts of the Spirit, but especially prophecy, with a tremendous amount more of the fear of the Lord than I think is demonstrated in a lot of the prophetic. Oh, absolutely. If you guys want to read more about the essence and energy controversy, read The Cosmic Mystery of Christ by St. Maximus, the Confessor. That'll explain a lot. All right, we're almost out of time. So quickly, Steve and then George Runyon. Steve Hannett. Yeah, guys, thank you, uh, Bishop. Thank you, guys. Great, great exchange of thoughts and ideas. You know, th there's been a, the whole activation thing has been kind of a, uh, something that I've been dealing with and, and, and speaking against in, in, in most ways it gets deployed. I think it's really, really vital among all the things that we've mentioned today is, um, is understanding the purpose of prophecy. And, and that is going to be linked uh, a whole lot with 
how that gift gets administered and released. And I think in activation, you know, Paul, the apostle, and I, and I love what Bishop uh, Kyle mentioned about stirring it up, because that's that's what I think is there. And I, and I ask the question continuously, um, who is doing the activating? Because man cannot baptize somebody in the Holy Spirit. Jesus baptizes somebody in the Holy Spirit. We can baptize them unto repentance with water, but but it's the it, it's Jesus who who imparts the Spirit. It's Jesus. It's the Spirit of God who releases that. So I think there's a whole lot of people who are activating something, and it, it's not connected to what God is doing. Um, they don't know the person many times at these conferences, and they're just activating gifts. It's just it, it's very very concerning to me personally. And we have to look at saying, you know, what is God doing and what is the context of that activation? Paul told Timothy, his beloved son, that he was stirring the gift, the laying on of his hands. He also told him to study and to show himself approved as a workman that needeth not be ashamed. So we have to look at the context of these things. So I, I'm in agreement with everybody. God can use anyone in a moment. And, and he can send them, and, and, and the Holy Spirit can speak through uh, people in, 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 uh, in their newness to Christ. But I don't think that that's necessarily prescriptive of, of how we should go about and, and nurture people um, moving forward. I, I think those are things that happen that we should celebrate while they're in the context of be, being established in the teaching and uh, in character, and, uh, and in maturity. Now, you make a great point. We quote that many times. Uh, Stir the gift of God that was in you through the laying out of my hands, 2 Timothy 1.7. And then we don't understand the context, and you say, well, that was Paul's spiritual son. He walked with Paul by that time, uh, probably 15 years, and uh, he knew that he was going to depart soon and go to glory. Those are his final words. So can you picture Paul the Apostle activating a person who's saved for three weeks in the gift of prophecy? I mean... Yeah, and and, and just as a side note quickly, but the pastoral epistles, which I, I like to call them leadership epistles more accurately, I think, but those, those epistles of Paul, um, that's like, you know, he's been with Timothy 20 years. And, and, and it's only after that, that extended long-term uh, investment in Timothy's life that he's entrusting uh, the, the stewardship of, of Paul's ministry. Paul knows that he's going to be leaving earth. He's entrusting this. And it blows my mind that the content of First and Second Timothy and Titus are not speaking about the sensational the sensationality of gifts, its foundational teaching of ordering households, of dealing with leaders. And I think a lot of leaders today would say, oh, it's too basic. That's, that, that's just too basic. I'm, 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 I'm above that. Yet it was the basic foundations that Paul was still, after 20 years, instilling in those men, knowing that if those things that he was building as a foundation ever became eroded, it would it would hinder the entire progress of the enterprise of the gospel. So I'm saying that because it's highlighting for me uh, the higher you go, the deeper your foundation must reach. And uh, and and I think that Paul knew what he was protecting uh, in in uh, in what he was leaving Timothy and Titus. I think that applies to uh, the fivefold and every believer to appreciate the magnitude of, of the basics and, and how vital it is. And, and this is somebody that was taken up to the third heaven. And that's yeah. what he chose to, to, to speak on. So we're not negating the supernatural, but I think we are highlighting the importance of the foundational. Hey, I'll say, uh, I'll take, take this to another level. I'm going to throw out another bomb. We talk about the kingdom of God. And Luke describes Paul's teaching three times in a book of Acts as the things concerning the kingdom. Yet when you read his epistles, it doesn't sound anything like this political top-down utilization of the church with seven mounds of taking over culture. 
He focuses on marriage, discipleship, doctrine, and most importantly, the Lordship of Christ over all creation. And uh, the understanding of the kingdom based on the epistles is basically live a life with a good witness. That's a manifestation of the kingdom. Manage your marriage, your children, uh, work with uh, your own hands, do good to your neighbor. Uh, these are just as much or more importantly part of the kingdom of being a strong church, a, a community of believers in a community that will eventually transform that culture because of the way they live. It's not just because of uh, becoming gatekeepers in the gates, and I believe in all that, but that's not the primary manifestation of the kingdom. Okay, we got a few more hands. This conversation has gone in places I didn't think it was going to go. A little controversial. My wife will tell you I love controversy, so uh, I have no problem with it. Uh, George Runyon, you had your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Bishop. Uh, this has been so good. Every church I, I relate with in this city needed to be sitting here. Every pastor needed to be hearing this. This was schooling today. The thing that comes to my mind, and I think you just touched on it, What's difficult about applying the scriptures is that we have created an environment that the scriptures don't know anything about. These large conferences and uh, that maybe are geared around the prophetic, the scripture doesn't know anything about that. It's rooted in family and in community. What did the apostles do? When they left the city, they went back and found the elders found who God had appointed to give oversight to the body and they ordained them and they weren't novices. And, and so part of our problem is, is our structure. And, and so then we try to apply the scriptures to that, but the scriptures don't know anything about the structure we have created. So that's <laughs> part of the dilemma we have. We've got to get back to the church of the locality Local churches need to find each other. It's in the church of the locality. The eldership of a community is where the safety and protection is really found. That's why unity is so important. And I believe it's high on the list of God's priorities. So that's just a few comments there. Thank you so much, man, for feeding us today. Well, spoken by a true seasoned apostle, G.D., had his hand up. JD, go ahead. All right. Uh, this has been amazing. And I think George just uh, spoke some of the things I wanted to say. I think if prophecy is practiced the way it is expressed in the New Testament, which is in the context of a local church, if you look at 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 14, even with all the drama going on in 1 Corinthians 14, Apostle Paul didn't discourage prophecy, didn't stop it. He tried to regulate it. Even though you know there were probably a lot of immature people in that kind of environment prophesying. So I personally wouldn't put a limit on who can prophesy uh, because I think it wouldn't matter that much if the practice itself is more New Testament. Uh, I think someone young, in faith, for example, Act 19.6, people spoke in tongues for the first time and prophesied. Uh, and these were, so I think it is very hard to try to say someone maybe new in faith, should or should not, because a lot of times these are sovereign work of God. Uh, Apostle Paul was trying to pray for these gentlemen in Acts chapter 19 to receive the Holy Spirit baptism. And at the same time, they prophesy. So, but I think so that that's where I will I will end it. I think prophecy should be taught, practiced in the context of a local church where it can be judged, it can be assessed. I think where there is such safety, I think it wouldn't matter when uh who can and cannot, because uh, the Spirit of God is giving the freedom to use whoever he wants to use in that kind of environment. Amen. That's very good. And I couldn't agree more. 
again, if God wants to give someone the gift of prophecy, they're first saved. But when you activate somebody, it's almost like commissioning them. So that's where I would have an issue. But um, but like you said, if it's all done in the context of the local church, not some public conference, which the context of First Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 has to do with local church dynamics, then the gift of prophecy can be judged. In a big conference, unless you're there with only pastors and leaders, you have new Christians getting prophecies without their pastor or, you know, whatever. I think it opens the door for them to even miscommunicate what the prophecy was. Of course, you could record it. My heart does go out to cessationist churches and people stuck in that. And so, yeah, we have to make allowances. There has to be a better vetting system. Too much to talk about today, but we don't want to quench the spirit. We want to see the gifts of God flourish. The reason why we had this table is not to be critical of the prophetic, but to see the prophetic explode. And you can't have freedom unless you have form. When you don't have form and guardrails, then you have chaos. You don't have freedom, you have bondage. So we're just talking about having proper guardrails. Everybody who spoke, spoke eloquently out of experience from a perspective that was very great. And uh, collectively, we interpret the word together. I've learned a lot today from hearing your voices. I'm sure you all have learned something. And that, that that's what this is all about. So next week, we're going to deal with the Gospel of John and Revelation together. And I'm excited about being in community with all of you. Let's just take our uh, phones off mute. Let me just end this recording. Uh, okay. Stop the live stream and stop. It doesn't, I don't even know if this is recorded. Recording stopped. I don't see where the recording on the Zoom is stopping. Yeah, same recording stopped. So. Yeah, but it it's didn't true. say that for the rec yeah. recording on the cloud. But anyway, let's say Fish, goodbye. going to activate us all before we go. <laughs> I, I, listen, I... <laughs> I I bless I, I believe you are called to preach, Bishop Kyle. I receive. I receive I'd that like commission. I'd like to activate people, Bishop, but before can I give you all my cash app? <laughs> hey, a great That's book funny. though on the energy's essence is by Dr. David Bradshaw. Uh, Aristotle, East and West: The Divide in Thinking Between Western and Eastern Christianity. It is excellent. Amen. Well, you could text that uh, text that to me. I don't think I've heard that before. And then put it in the chat. Anybody else? Uh, well, this is not comments, but we're saying goodbye. Okay. God bless you.